fine piano players, and uh, what a blessing in our, our little church to have such, uh, such talent and folks that are willing to, to do that. We sure appreciate it. We kind of take you for granted, you know, because it's just always, always going, but uh, we, we do appreciate it. I've, I've been able to visit with uh, June, June and Nick, uh, a lot, and uh, she'd been up and down, and uh, today when I went in, she smiled and stood up and took a selfie and <laughs> with me and, me and her, and uh, you know, I, was, I was really pleased to see her smiling. It's, there's been times when she just could hardly, uh, she couldn't even lift her head, you know, just so full of pain, but uh, uh, who, who knows what the Lord might do. Keep praying for her. Amen. Uh, people are praying for her all, all over the place. And, uh, you know, the Lord can use these things for good. And uh, we know that He loves us. It's, it's not by uh, the, the pain or uh, those things that we know what God thinks. Uh, it's, it's by what He's done in, in Jesus and what He, what he says. So um, everybody has trouble. Some just have more than others. And uh, some are, a little, are much more difficult. Second Corinthians 13 tonight. Uh, we're we're going to finish the book. Our poor missionary came the other day. I wouldn't even let him preach because I wanted to finish the Corinthians before we I left. But uh, he was all right. We've looked at a lot of things. There's some great stuff in, in this uh, this book and the whole the whole of the Bible, of course. But Second Corinthians, you know, it, it's such a blessing when you you start off and he talks about how God comforts us in our tribulation, and he does it. One reason that he does it is to help us to comfort others when they go through the, the same thing. And we can learn from the Lord and share it with others. And then he talked about Satan's devices and how we have victory in Jesus. You know, Satan doesn't have any new tricks. He just uses the same ones over and over. And we keep falling for them. But God tells us, and he says we have victory. Um, he talked about, I think it was chapter 3, how to respond to criticism. Well, read that one again. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it happens. Um, he talked about motives for ministry and service. You know, all the reasons we should love the Lord and serve Him. He talked about separation. You know, staying clean so we can serve the Lord. Amen. You know, we're, we're vessels, and the main thing about a vessel is you want a clean one. And if you have a choice between a dirty dish and a clean dish, you'll choose the clean one every time. <laughs> and uh, the Lord's the same. Uh, he talked about uh, fellowship, you know, the comfort and rebuke of fellowship. A lot of people don't think about it, but one of the purposes for fellowship is so that we have people who will tell us when we're wrong. Um, anyway, and then he talked about giving. I was going to make another comment there, but you know, sometimes some comments are better not said. Um, chapters 8, 8 and 9 was about giving, some great things there. And then chapters 10 through 13, he, he deals quite extensively with his apostleship, defending it and describing it. And uh, we can learn a lot from his response to this. Uh, one of the things we saw was that he, he followed Christ's example. Yeah, and that's a, that's a testimony in itself, isn't it? Whatever is happening to us, we should follow Christ's example and he used spiritual weapons. You know, he said that the weapons of our warfare are not, are not carnal, they're spiritual. And quite often we have this, the opposite reaction, don't we? You know, something happens, we turn to the world's carnal weapons. And he, he looked to God's authority, he looked to God's calling, he looked to God's commendation. He wanted God's well done. And uh, you know, there's, there's just some great lessons there for us. In, in chapter 12, I'd have to say he... He shamed them, really, and, and rightfully so. Look at uh, chapter 12, verse 11. It says, I, I'm become a fool in glorying. You've compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. He's saying, you're the ones who, who should have been commending me. I, I've, yeah, I'm the one that led you to the Lord and, and, and brought the, the gospel to you uh, for their lack of condom, com, commendation. Get that right? In verse 15, for their lack of appreciation. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Sounds kind of like a parent's job, doesn't it? <laughs> Better job you do as a parent, the harder time your kids have until they grow up. Then they thank you. And uh, you know, I guess the Corinthians were still growing up. Now Paul draws his letter to a close in chapter, you know, it wouldn't have had a chapter, I guess, as a, as a letter, but uh, by, by warning and encouraging them. Let's read... Uh, Chapter 13, verses 1 through 3 to start. This is the, is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned, 
to all other that if I come again, I will not spare, since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you were is not weak, but is mighty in you. Uh, he, he's warning them here. Uh, prepare yourselves. I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> uh, you can deal with sin or I'll deal with it when I come. Uh, but uh, prepare yourself. It, it, it's not really a threat, but he's just letting them know. This is the third time I'm coming to you. And he says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And, and that's an important principle there. Uh, in dealing with sin, uh, it's based on fact, not rumor. You know, it's not enough to say, oh, I think this might be happening, or so-and-so said this could be going on. Uh, you know, the Bible in Matthew 18 says that if you think there's something wrong, you go to that person individually. You don't, you don't share it with others. You don't spread it around. Uh, you go to them, and usually most times that'll, that's all you need to do. That'll sort it out. You'll find out it's not true, or they'll say, yeah, and, and they'll quit, or you know, whatever. Matthew 18, you, you need to know that's there and, and understand it and use it. He's saying prepare yourself. Um, and he, he uses some interesting words here. Verse, thir- uh, verse 3, uh, he says, Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you it is not weak, but is mighty in you. Then he goes on and says, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. It's some almost strange verses to me. Talking about weakness and strength and comparing... Weakness to the crucifixion and strength to the resurrection. Uh, but uh, I think the point is this, that sometimes in dealing with problems, you need to be weak and sometimes you need to be strong. And wisdom is knowing the difference. You know, sometimes you don't need to make a big deal of it. Sometimes you do. Uh, there's things in life that, man, you know, people are making decisions and, and boy, they're, they're uh, you know, it's like they're jumping off a cliff kind of a thing. And uh, there's a time for strength, there's a, there's a time for weakness. In... Uh, 1 Thessalonians, he uses these words, of chapter 5, verse 14. We exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. So there's something that's toward everybody, patience. He says, some people you have to warn them. Hang on, that's, that's, you know, you're a Christian, that's not right. Others, you comfort them. In a way, it's, it's like what he's saying there about the crucifixion and the resurrection. You know, the crucifixion dealt with sin, didn't it? Resurrection brought life. And sometimes there's a negative, sometimes there's a positive in dealing with, with situations. And he's saying to that church, uh, you know, I can come to you in strength, I can come to you in weakness, but uh, the truth will out. Uh, verse 8, I think, is the key verse of this chapter. We can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. You know, no matter what we do or say, eventually the truth is going to come out. And uh, whether it backs us up or not is not the point. Uh, in Galatians, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You know, there's the weakness, there's the strength. And in our own lives and in the, in the lives of others, um, it's like what he says there in 2 Corinthians 13, 4, the, the second sentence, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. So there's, there's weakness and strength in, in our Christian lives. And so he says, first of all, prepare yourselves. You know, deal with things. Secondly, he says in verse uh, 5, examine yourselves. Specifically, he says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should, not that, let me emphasize the right thing here, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. He keeps using that word reprobate, doesn't he? And uh, what the problem was, is they were accusing him of, of not being right. Well, he's saying, listen, you're the fruit of my ministry. If I'm reprobate, so are you. <laughs> you, know? uh, you can't have it both ways. They'd been examining Paul. You know, in verse 3, you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. And he's saying, you know, what you really need to do is examine yourself. And that's a pretty good rule to life, let me tell you. Uh, when you notice something in somebody else, a red light should go on, examine self, examine self. <laughs> uh, there's a verse in R- Romans 2 where the Bible tells us that the things we notice in others 
usually are the things that are problems that we have. I used to use the example, I, I, I was foolish enough one time to buy a Volkswagen Combi. <laughs> anyway, that's another story, but uh, having that, I began to notice, oh, there's one, there's, there's a car. You know, I didn't notice them before, but when I had one, I noticed. And it's kind of that way with sin. When, when you have a particular problem, you notice it in others. And the thing is, their sin might come out in a different way than yours does, but it's the same root, root problem. The, the verse I was getting to is Romans 2, 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. And it, that's just a, a principle of life. Uh, the main one we're responsible for is ourself. And uh, we need to examine ourselves. And he's saying to them, uh, you know, they were his, the best proof of, that God was using him. Uh, earlier on, he, he'd said, uh, ye are our epistle, <laughs> written in, in, in our hearts. You know, they were the example of, of his ministry. So if, if they thought Paul was reprobate, they were in trouble. And uh, he talks about some, some areas of examination. I think these are, are really key. Uh, in verse 5, he, he says, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Man, that's, that's crucial, isn't it? We talked about that a little bit this morning, but uh, you know, oftentimes people wonder and doubt about their own salvation. That's, that's the, the most essential issue, isn't it? You know, you can, you can do all these spiritual things, but if you're not saved, what difference will it make? What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and, and lose his own soul? Uh, are you saved? Uh, there's some, some things that we can look at in, in Scripture. For instance, in Romans chapter 8, it says that if you're saved, the Holy Spirit will bear witness with you. And you need to understand what that means, but let me read it. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 9. He's talking to Christians. He says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And he puts it in the negative. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, later on, he says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, God, God's Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit is not always going to be good news. <laughs> you know, now the Holy Spirit sometimes brings conviction. Uh, you know, sometimes He's going to really get after you and, and convict you. In fact, that's, that's the struggle non-Christians have when they're in the grip of conviction. They think, oh, this can't be good. <laughs> it feels terrible to be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Um, just thinking about it today, how that... You know, when I was a young man, you know, sometimes you have sin in your life. And, uh, you know, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit doesn't like that. He's going to get after you. And, and your first reaction oftentimes is, oh, I must not be saved. But listen, if the Holy Spirit's after you, it's because you are saved. You, usually, in, unless it's, uh, you know, conviction for salvation. So uh, we need to be careful. Uh, does the Holy Spirit bear witness? There, there's several indications he gives in, in 1 John. For instance, 1 John 3, 14. This is an interesting one. He says, We know that we have passed from death unto life. What's that? Salvation, isn't it? Because we love the brethren. And again, he puts it in the negative. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Christians have a love for other Christians. I meet people all the time. We say, oh yeah, we're Christians. But they have nothing to do with any, any other Christians. That's not love. Love is not a feeling you hide in your heart, you know. It's, uh, love is an action. Love is a commitment. Do you love the brethren? Uh, 1 John 2, 29, you might say, um, do you practice righteousness? If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Yeah, there's, a, there's a desire to do right. It doesn't mean you'll always do right, but uh, later on he puts it this way. It's, it's kind of hard to understand. 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, that's not about habitual sin. You can't stay in sin. Sin is going to bother you, is what he's saying. In 1 John 5, verse 4, he says, uh, You overcome by faith. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? There's evidence of God in your life of the Holy Spirit, of Jesus, when, you, when you're saved. It's not just words you say, 
I'll never forget years ago a lady saying that uh, she, she said that uh, she said the words, and she said she went home, went home and told her husband, and he said the words too. That's exactly the way she put it. You know, and to me, I thought, man, that sounds like hocus pocus, you know. Um, and there really wasn't any evidence in their lives of, of salvation. It was just words. See, salvation is not just certain words, you say. It's a change of heart. It's a change of relationship with the Lord. Uh, he says, examine yourself whether you're in the faith. Well, the only way to do that is compare it to God's Word. Hold up the mirror of, of God's Word. Um, secondly, in verse 7, are you obedient? Not only are you saved, but then are you obedient? Now, I pray to God that ye do no evil. Not that we should appear approved. He's saying, this is not for my benefit. This is not so people say, oh, that Paul, he's got a good church. Um, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. <laughs> yeah, he's a little bit sarcastic there, I think. I'm not sure. Um, and it's not to lord it over other people. I meet some, I meet some folks who, you know, it's like, well, I'm, I'd never do that. I'm, boy, you know, they're, they're living like that. I'd never, you know, we don't do right so that we're better than someone else. We do right to, to please the Lord. And, uh, you know, when someone else does wrong, man, that should break our heart, not, not make us uh, happy about it. It's like in a family. You know, when, when your brother or sister in the family succeeds, you should be happy for them. When they fail, you should, you should be sorry for them, you know, and, and want to help them. But, you know, sometimes in a family, it's the opposite. One sibling, you know, does well, and, oh, I wish they'd have failed. <laughs> uh, we need to be careful as Christians and, and examine ourselves. Eventually, the truth will be known. That's, that's why we do everything, is for the truth. If it's not, we have the wrong, the wrong motives. We might as well be honest with God. It, surely it's occurred to you by now that God knows everything anyway. <laughs> so you might as well be honest with Him. If you're feeling stroppy with Him, you might as well say it. Putting it into words will help you. you know, just actually saying to the Lord something negative uh, will help you. Because you'll think, this is not right for me to say this. <laughs> For me to be like this really is, is the attitude. So there's some areas we need to examine. Number one, are you saved? Are you obedient? So he warns them. Prepare yourselves. Examine yourselves. I, th I think I've heard it said the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think that's true. You know, just to go through life and never stop and think, well, what's going on? Where, where am I going? What's happening? And for a Christian, what is, what is God doing? Prepare yourselves, examine yourselves. But then he encourages them. Uh, verse 7 is, is partly encouragement as well. Uh, I pray to God that you do no evil. Aren't you glad that there's people who pray for you? Boy, I am. You know, I hear of different ones that pray for me, and man, I appreciate that. I try to tell people sometimes, I've been praying for you. Because that, that's an encouragement, I, I think, to, to others. You know, whether my you don't always know whether your prayers make much difference or not, but uh, you know, it's, the Lord tells us to pray. In uh, verse 9, He says, For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. It's interesting, that word wish there is the exact same word as in verse 7, I pray. Uh, it, it, what it meant was, it was His heart's desire that they follow the Lord. He was praying for them. His, the desire in His heart it was for their perfection. Now understand, in, in Scripture, the word perfection means completion. Complete. The example I always use is my face. My face is perfect. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I don't know about you. Uh, it, it's all there. <laughs> There's nothing missing. It's all there. And uh, th that's what he's talking about. We need to have and use everything that we have in Christ. Uh, the term is used to mean uh, to set a broken bone in Scripture. And when you set a broken bone, that's perfect. Back in place. Uh, it means to equip an army. When the army has everything it needs for the battle, it's perfect. They're set. Uh, to mend a net. Perfect is used there. You know, it, before it wasn't perfect. Now it's, it's right. It's ready to go. It's complete. Uh, God wants us perfect. <laughs> he wants us mature. Growing in Him. And God uses a lot of different things to, to do that. One is His Word. Uh, you probably know 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable.
for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You remember this verse? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God wants us mature, complete, and His Word will help, help us in that. Another thing that helps is our church. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 11 or so. He talks about the foundations and then the continuing of the church. He says, He gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, do we all come in the unity of the faith for the perfecting of the saints? See, your church is there to help you be complete. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you need people to help, but you also need people to help you. Sometimes you need people to disagree with you. You know, that's what's good about a family and a church. Uh, people who live on their own, you know, sometimes they get some of the oddest ideas because nobody's ever said, oh, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> and we need to hear that sometimes. Maybe not in those, those words, but... Uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, we, we need to knock up against each other a little bit. And uh, our church will help us. Isn't it great? Aren't you glad to know people pray for you? But you should also be glad sometimes when people disagree with you. We don't have to be disagreeable, but we can disagree. And that's important. Uh, we can all be wrong sometimes, helping each other and, and uh, sharpening each other. So the Bible, our church, helps us to be complete. Uh, there's another one. I don't really like this one, but 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, he says that suffering will help us to mature and to be complete. 1 Peter 5.10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You know, suffering, if, if you lean on the Lord in your suffering, will help you. Uh, there's things you'll learn. Uh, there's a poem that comes to mind. Um, let me think how it goes. I walked a mile with gladness. She chattered all the way and left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and not a word said he. But oh, the things I learned when sorrow walked with me. But you know, we only learn that if we'll turn to the Lord. Now, there's people who go through sorrow and they, they let it make them bitter. Uh, we need to turn to the Lord. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. See, that's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about being complete in the Lord. He encourages them. You know, what, a, what a blessing it is to know that, that, uh, that God, God will help us in our suffering. And in each of these, His Word, His church, and suffering, all of those, it's only if we'll turn to the Lord. You know, if you're not reading His Word, you're not going to be, be growing and complete. If you're not in church and, and you know, bouncing around with God's people, uh, you know, you're not going to get that growth that you need. And in suffering, if you're not turning to the Lord and trusting Him, uh, you won't have that, that help that He offers. You know, like, like He said in, in 2 Corinthians 1, He's the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to, able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God ministers to us so that we can minister to others. He encouraged them by prayer. He encouraged them by God's Word. Uh, did you notice there? Well, we haven't read it yet. 2 Corinthians uh, 13, verse 10. Therefore I write these things, being absent. Now, if I wrote that to you, that wouldn't mean much. But when Paul writes that to you, <laughs> He's writing the Word of God here. And therefore, I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. You know, God had given Paul that place of an apostle. He had a position. He had power. He had responsibilities. He had rights. And uh, he said God didn't give it to him for destruction. He gave it to, to help them. And... Uh, yeah, as he writes to them, he's writing to us also. And uh, you know, what a blessing it is that uh, we, can, we can go to God's Word and know that we have the truth and know that it will always be the same. Yeah, you have to laugh in a way. It's that or cry. Some of these churches where they say, oh, they've got to keep up with the times. Uh, listen, that, that's the problem. 
Uh, the times, they're no good. <laughs> uh, the culture we live in, that's not the answer. What they need is to get back to the old path, get back to the Word of God. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, you may grow thereby. That needs to be our attitude toward God's Word. Uh, toward the end of, well, right at the end of 2 Peter, he says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, God's Word, prayer, uh, His, His church, uh, our church, uh, all of these things can help us and be a blessing. He encourages them. Uh, he warns them, then He encourages them. And then He comes to the conclusion. Finally, brethren, farewell. Now, I love this, this next statement. Be perfect. I, I think that should be just a saying around our church. See you, brother? Be perfect. <laughs> uh, be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. And there's a lot in those few verses. But he's just bringing it down to an end. and He's saying, first of all, keep growing. When he says be perfect, it's like we, I think we read it this morning, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance. You keep adding. You keep growing in the things of the Lord. So if these things be in you and abound, they make it that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, there's a good promise. Be perfect. Be of good comfort is the second one. It's just be encouraged. Listen, as Christians, we don't need to be negative. I mean, I know life is tough. I've got it tough. You've got it. I mean, we've all got it tough, <laughs> some worse than others. But we don't have to be downhearted. We can be, a, we can be encouraged. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Listen, we can focus on our problem or we can focus on the Lord. Uh, you know, in eternity, God says our life is going to look like a vapor. You seen a vapor lately? <laughs> you know, it comes up, my glasses get steamed up, you know. <laughs> it's not much to it. It doesn't, doesn't, matter, it doesn't amount to much. And, and yet it's important that we be right with the Lord. It's important the things of eternity. Don't, don't become or be a negative Christian. And then he gives a group of several that really have to do with be united. He says, be of one mind, live in peace. Those are good things. He gives kind of the, the result, the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a an holy kiss. You know, greet each other. I know Christians who won't greet other Christians. That's just not right. Uh, we need to, to be united. And then in uh, verse 13, all the saints salute you. That should encourage you. You're not alone. <laughs> I found it interesting in our travels over the years. You, you can go someplace with people you never met before, and in Christ you have a, a common bond. I've even found it with people where I couldn't speak the same language. <laughs> it's amazing. In Christ, you know, all the saints salute you. And then the, the last verse, verse 14, I just find incredible. Uh, remember the Lord. You know, just this verse alone should encourage you. Uh, this is talking about who our God is. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. These are what we have. This is who our Lord is. You know, the first one, the grace of Jesus, that should remind us of Bethlehem. The reason I say that is 2 Corinthians 8 9. We, we read it when we talked about giving. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. What a blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus. You have that. He offers it to you. It's It's yours. He, he left heaven for, for you and me. Reminds us of uh, how much He loves us. The grace of the Lord Jesus. And He says, the love of God. That reminds us of Calvary. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Man, you know, I was thinking today, you get downhearted, just, just go to this verse and think about these, these three things. All you have in, in the Lord. The triunity of God. And then the communion of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that word communion is the word fellowship or uh, in the Greek it's koinonia. You, you might have heard of that. You know, the fellowship we have as, as believers. And that fellowship is based on the fact that we, number one, have fellowship with the Lord. 1 John 1, 3, That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The fellowship of the, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you know, when, when God said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, 
Go ye therefore, and teach all nations. And when he said, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You know, that's, that's, what, that's the Holy Spirit that he's talking about. That's who we have. The, the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you. Now, those three things in particular, the grace of Jesus, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, do you know these? Do you understand these? Have you learned these and understood that if you're saved, those are yours? Uh, listen, you need them. You need them personally. Uh, you're not going to have the life God intends for you to have if you don't understand the grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost. Listen, if you're looking for it in this world, I can guarantee you, you'll be disappointed. Uh, people will rob you. People will lie to you. People will disappoint you. And you'll do the same to them. Don't kid yourself. Uh, you're looking for it in the world, you won't find it. But if you're looking for it in God, He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His grace is always sufficient. His love is always there. His communion, the Holy Spirit. Listen, God gave us the promise He'd never leave us or forsake us. And how good is that? <laughs> I can't make that promise to anybody. Yeah, I could drop dead tomorrow. I was saying, my plane could disappear. Wouldn't that be exciting? <laughs> uh, we need them as a church. We need to understand the grace of, of Jesus, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Paul, uh, I think it's a, a great book, and I, I've enjoyed uh, studying through it and, and preaching it. Uh, in this last chapter, he warns them, prepare yourself, examine yourself. Uh, he encourages them. And then he, he closes really just by saying, remember the Lord. And if you get nothing else out of it, think, oh, what was that verse? Uh, the last verse of 2 Corinthians. And encourage yourself with, with that. Memorize it, maybe. And uh, what a blessing that, that'll be as you see uh, the grace of Jesus, the love of God, communion of the Holy Spirit. We have it. We can enjoy it. Uh, we can be blessed. We're going to close with uh, the song uh, 285, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's sing a couple of verses of that, and, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Page 285.